Welcome to Unlocking Science. Our goal is to glorify God by studying and unlocking the secrets of His amazing creation. I'm your host, Mr. P, and I'm joined today by Mr. Ron Dudek, and we're going to teach you in this hands-on episode how you can rescue a, a fly trap or other plants that you might find at your garden center that are struggling. Now, we had you explain a lot of information about Venus fly traps in our episode, Cursed Plants, Venus fly traps. And we've also done an episode that's uh, dealing with pitcher plants nice. and sundews. So a lot of these same things would apply to all of those carnivorous plants. So we're gonna be looking at carnivorous plants and how to care for them. Now, it's been my experience, uh, <laughs> back when we had younger kids, we ordered this little pod of seeds and it looked like a little egg and a space alien egg. Mm -hmm. And it gave us the instructions to plant all of these things. And after about six months of staring at a little pod of brown yeah. dirt, my kids lost interest. What was the issue there? You bought seeds. <laughs> you want to buy a you, know, you want to buy a, an adult plant. <laughs> okay, so the seeds are really not the best way to go in most cases. So if you want to grow a Venus flytrap or other types of carnivorous plants, we'd really recommend getting an established plant yes. from the beginning and then nurturing it to get it to grow bigger because it can take years mm. to even get a fly trap the size of a BB <laughs> growing on <laughs> some of those plants. So we really don't recommend the seeds. Mm. Go for um, the, the plants that you can find that are already established a little bit. Okay, so you've had the experience a lot. You, you are like the, the fly trap whisperer. <laughs> And you've gone into some of these home improvement stores or garden stores, and you find these little plastic boxes like this one that you've yeah. got over there. We, we call this a death cube. <laughs> okay. So this is this is a Venus flytrap, if you can't tell, but it looks like a little brown shriveled up. So why is it a death cube for this plant? Well, let me give you a little history here then. If you look at these two plants right here, two potted that you see here, potted plants, there are multiple here. I went to our local garden store. This was, and I even dated it right here. So you can see this was back in early March and it had a tray full of these little death cubes and the, they'd only been there about a week. So I bought, I think there's four in here and uh, potted them in here. And this is how they look now. You can see after, you know, so many weeks. I went back in there, here you see April 29th and there were still some left from that tray and I potted those. You can see how they look, they're gonna make it. But then I went back in on Monday this week and there were a few left from that tray and that's what was in there. So those little cubes don't have any way for the air to be exchanged inside. They're gonna get hot temperature extremes and they're just and, gonna die. And the biggest thing here, we'll take you, there's no way for water. So there's, I just pulled the soil right out of the pot. And it's dry as and a bone. And that thing is dry as a bone and this poor little plant gave up the trap a long time yeah. ago. So when you're picking one out from a store, make sure you've got one that looks healthy, that's got wet soil. Try and find the best one that you can. But even some that are, look a little meager, you might be able to nurse them back to health. Well, if you look at the date here, you know, this was March 10th, mm -hmm. all right? And you look at the date here, April 29th. I mean, that shows you how long the plants had been there and they were still viable. Mm -hmm. So these will recover. They'll look like, they'll, these will look like this in a couple of months, but when you get them, when I call them fresh, that's what you get. That's a great result there. And you can tell also, if you notice, we get lots of color in this one. We're getting good reds inside the leaves of the traps and the other ones are looking a little darker green. So this is a much healthier look to the plant than, than the ones over there yeah. on the right side. Okay, so we've gone into the store, we've picked out the plant that we think is going to survive and thrive and we want to get this spectacular fly yeah. trap that's going to be able to catch the neighbor's cat. We yes. want it to be that big. Is it ever going to get that big? No, it won't get that big, but I'll tell you what, it, it'll get big enough to give you to bite your finger. You want to take a look at this here. This one here is going to bite my finger. Look at that. It's a good thing you're strong and you can escape from that trap. Uh. But in the episode, we actually, uh, the Venus flytrap episode we did for Unlocking Science, we fed a cricket and it actually triggered and caught the cricket. Now, this one is closed for now, 
but because there's nothing inside there wriggling around, it's not going to get you to stimulate those hairs and it will close any up. further. Yeah, yeah by it'll tomorrow it'll look like this again. And it'll open back up. And they can tri typically only trigger a few times. So if I have a pet plant, <laughs> and let's say we gave it a name, like I call my Sundew Sylvester, mm -hmm and we keep triggering those leaves, yes. what's gonna to happen to them? Well, the individual trap on a Venus fly trap will only close about a dozen times. So if you're one of those folks, and I only do that rarely for demonstration purposes, and you're constantly tricking your trap shut, after about a dozen times, the traps can't shut anymore. See, they're not like muscle tissue, like we can do this hundreds <laughs> and hundreds and hundreds of times. Uh, those are plant cells, which are rigid, and every time they do that rapid closure, there's a change in the shape of the cell, and it has a limited number of times to do that. So there's one thing. If you own a fly trap and you want to demonstrate to your friends how it closes, do it once in a while. Uh, just don't make a habit of it. Or actually feed it a fly oh, yeah. or a cricket or something that you capture. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've, we've gathered our plant and we've, we've got it home now. We don't want to leave it in the death cube because it will certainly die there. So what types of things would we need to have available if we were going to rescue this plant and repot it? All right, first thing I want to talk about. This is the evolution of Venus Wait flytrap. a minute, you can't be talking about evolution on this show, Ron. Come on. We have to. All right. All right. These, these are, this, believe it or not, if you go back to, you know, 15 years ago, most Venus fly traps were sold in a pot about that size. That's a, call that a three inch pot. And then over the years, they've morphed to pots that size, to this size, to that size. And this is the current size I'm seeing. So this really is change over time, but this it's is changed, and it's observed very, in a human lifetime. Definitely not, not leading to the elevation of the species. Sure. But the Venus flytrap, really, a single plant will do best in a four inch or larger pot. So the first thing I would recommend, and plastic, you want to do a plastic pot. If you get one of those orange ceramic pots, uh, they can hold minerals. We'll get into that in a minute that are harmful to the plant. But a four inch plastic pot or even a little bit bigger is the first thing I would want to grab to and, repot it. And what about the bottom of the pot? You like to have drainage holes mm -hmm. because you want to be able to have water absorb into the bottom so the roots can draw it up. Yep. So you don't want a sealed pot. And with the fly trap, they don't like their roots in stagnant water. So it's a good idea that it can, it can come through every so often and it helps aerate the soil. Yeah, again, that mimics their natural environment. Mm -hmm. Next thing I'm gonna look for, this is, this is huge now. We're gonna talk about water because most people bring their Venus fly trap home and before you can get into the other ingredients, you wanna have the right water. So I'm gonna show you something that uh, very important with water. This is the tap water that mm -hmm. I just took from we the pulled creation. pulled that right out of the sink here at the Creation Museum. So I'm gonna show you something with what's <coughs> called a TDS meter, total dissolved solids. And what this does, this measures the amount of stuff in the water here. So I'm gonna turn it on and I'm gonna immerse it in here. And the number is coming up at about 136. And it may, this is gonna fluctuate for a little bit here, but you're in the 100 and upper 130s in terms of parts per million, probably minerals and what have you in yeah. this water. So we have pretty hard water, lots of calcium and things in it. Mm -hmm. Now up in Michigan, it's in the upper 200s where I live. Yeah, so that, that would is, depend on the water supply. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That is totally unacceptable for a Venus flytrap. Mm -hmm. And many times when you go and you buy a flytrap, it may have instructions that say place in water they didn't tell you that it has to be water with a total dissolved solids less than 50. Uh, 136 is a little too high. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to rinse this rinse off in here over there. just to get the old stuff off. Now, this is water that I, I have at a filtration system home. It's a reverse osmosis filtration system. Not really orange juice. Not really orange. Even the label I says so. It. Okay. <laughs> so we're going to put some of this reverse osmosis water. By the way, you can buy this in jugs in your any grocery store. Sure, distilled water. Distilled would work water or reverse osmosis. Mm -hmm. Now watch why I put this in there. Two. Two. Our other reading was 137. Yeah. So a lot less dissolved minerals in there. So why is why is having the minerals in the water dangerous or bad for these plants? Well, these plants grow in nutrient deficient soils in uh, boggy areas mm -hmm. that receive most of their water from rain. And so the soil is very low in nutrients. The, there's a moss in the area called sphagnum moss also drinks up the nutrients. Mm -hmm. Their roots are literally designed to live in a low nutrient, highly acidic soil. And 
So if you take the soil, even a good soil, and put tap water into it, you're going to start you're adding, adding minerals. And as you do that over weeks and it's months, build up. you're building up the mineral concentration so there. Mm -hmm. First and foremost, when it comes to these next three we're going to talk about, sunlight, soil, and water. So get yourself a four-inch part, pick yourself up a jug of distilled water mm -hmm. or reverse osmosis water. Now we're going to talk soil. Mm. I do not work for this company. I am not endorsing this <laughs> brand, but it is a brand that I use. You, it's Canadian Sphagnum Peat Moss. comes from peat bogs. This is pure peat moss. There is no additives to it. There are no nitrogen no products, fertilizers, fertilizers, or anything like that in it. This is very similar to the soil they grow in. It is the only soil I use. It's the only one I would recommend. And you can mix that with perlite. You cannot use miracle Grow products. miracle Grow no. products works great for your marigolds. Don't use anything that's got fertilizers right. in it for these But plants. these two brands I happen to use, there's other ones that are 100% perlite, 100% peat moss, and I'll show you what those two items look like. There's your peat moss. It kind of looks like dirt. And that's the sphagnum moss after it has broken down below the surface. And what this perlite is, it's a lava rock that has been heated and it expands like popcorn and it's completely inert. And that helps hold moisture. It really absorbs water and it's a porous substance that will help hold water in the and it, soil. And it helps to add aeration in mm -hmm. the soil because peat moss can pack down in a pot. Yep. So what this does, it helps aeration and water move through the soil. Mm -hmm. So what I do is I recommend a 50-50 mix in my soil medium of those items. Now, for those of you that sometimes read online, hey, you can mix sand with your peat moss. <sighs> yes, you've got to be really careful with this one. Yeah. They, even some of the experts fail to explain this to you. It can't be any sand. This is silica sand, or what's commonly called pool sand. It is also inert. It does not add yeah. any minerals to the soil. So, and but the problem is, you got to buy this stuff in like 80-pound bags. Yeah. So if you go buy a um, or go out to the creek bed and dig up a, a pile of sand. It's going to have lots of organics and minerals in it that are going to yeah, cause problems. You don't problems. want to do that. So mm -hmm. I always recommend my perlite over sand. You'll never go wrong with yep. a non miracle Grow brand of perlite. Now also, in the event you can't find that, you can also use orchid moss. Mm -hmm. And what orchid moss is, it's the sphagnum peat moss before it breaks down. Yeah, before it's all decomposed and, and Yeah, You can down. shred this stuff and use this as a soil medium just by itself. Mm -hmm. And again, I brought some here if you want to get a close-up of what it looks like. And there are some times I use this, but the 50-50 sphagnum peat moss perlite mix to me is my favorite one. Okay, so now, we could make a big mess with this, but I think you've got a method that makes it pretty low mess. All right. If I was mixing up tons of peat, which I do sometimes. <laughs> you do it in your wheelbarrow. I do it in my wheelbarrow. Container, but. So here's how we're going to mix a small amount just for that four inch pot. So I take my gallon, my gallon baggie here. By the way, this perlite can make a lot of dust. So if you're yep. working with a lot, I wear my mask. Blow that away. Now what you do, take your peat moss. Toss that in. Now we're going to do the old, remember the old commercial? It's shake and bake, and we help. Well, we're going to shake and bake this just a little bit. That was a long time mm -hmm. ago. All right, let's seal this up. There we go. Ah. And we're going to get a good mix here. Mix it all up. You get a nice 50-50 mix. A those... little bit more. There we go. Mm -hmm. All right, now. I don't remember which beaker was which, so we're we'll going to be safe this. and go right from the bottle. So we just go, I'm going to put a little bit in here at a time. Just kind of, and then you just, peat moss has a lot of air spaces mm -hmm. in it, so you can work the soil like this to get the water to penetrate the sphagnum peat So moss. you're just really squeezing that together and getting yeah, that water to, just a to little penetrate bit more. in there. That's good. And see, I'm not getting it under my fingernails mm -hmm. or anything. But or you could wear gloves and rubber gloves and uh, protect yourself if you didn't want to get dirty. Yeah, I mixed well. up about uh, 150 pounds of this <laughs> last week, no joke. And I was all gowned up and just a little bit more. Ooh, that might have been too no, much. No, that's just perfect. It'll Once we get to the end, it, it it's going to really be kind of like there. cookie dough. Yeah. Ooh, that makes me hungry. Mm -hmm. Man.
That looks Ooh. like Oreos crushed up. I think up. we're going to have a little left over, so. All right. All right, one more hit just like that, a little squirt there. Okay, that makes me think of the Oreo crust on a cheesecake, and now I'm ready for a snack. All right. <laughs> okay, so we've got our pot, we've got our soil. Now, what I'm about to show you next is not necessary, but it is one of Ron Dudek's secrets. <laughs> You're getting the inside secret If you happen here. to have a little of this stuff, the benefit of having a little bit of the orchid moss the spe is you can put that in the bottom and it helps to keep the soil from leaking out of these holes. You yep. don't have to do this, most people don't, but since I use both soil mediums, now for the sake of sanitation, I am going to put on this glove. <laughs> That's why I wear my lab coat, I don't have to worry about that All stuff. Right. We're going to get this area a little bit messy, but it's a lab, right? So you're going to compress that down just a little bit. You don't want to pack it in super tight. Not too tight yet. I'm going to come up just to the rim so it's just full. Get this out of there. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to make a little hole in the middle. And look at this, this little guy over here realizes it's found a good home. You're thinking about the size of the hole matching the size of the pot that you've got so there. Give it a couple little light squeezes like this. Look at that, it popped right out of there. I can probably put a little more a little in more there. more down the bottom. Some of that stayed in the bottom of the cup, but... Look at that, put it in. Problem. And just work it in from the sides with your thumb. Now you don't want to press down right in the middle, you're going to kill that plant, and we don't want to damage that rhizome that's in there. But right there, look at this, I've got a nice plant, look at this, and this thing is singing hallelujah right now. He knows, <laughs> that, he saw what happened to He's his buddy over there. He's been rescued from the cube of death. <laughs> okay, so these are the techniques that you would use if you wanted to create um, a big, beautiful plant. Now, there are lots of other things to, involved with watering it and the schedule for watering it and how to do those things. But this is going to give you a great start on turning one of those plants that you can buy at your garden center mm -hmm. into a beautiful fly trap like this. Best left mm -hmm. outdoors. outdoors. So your last one, you talked about the water, you talked about the soil, and now we talk about the sun. sun. I would set this, like I said, in a little tray about one quarter to one third high mm -hmm. of the proper kind of water and find a nice sunny location for it. And this is what it'll look like in several weeks. All right, we hope you guys will be able to um, benefit from this information, be able to grow some amazing fly traps, and then use this as a way as friends and neighbors come over to visit to point to God's amazing design. And you can learn more about that in our, mm -hmm. uh, our Cursed Plants uh, episode that we did for Unlocking Science, and the title of that one was Cursed Plants Fly Traps. So check that episode out. The hands-on instructions will be available as a PDF down in the description of this video. You can download that and follow along with those instructions, remind you how to do all these steps. We hope you enjoyed this episode, and until we see you next time, get out and enjoy all of God's amazing creation. And rescue a fly trap. <laughs>